Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week's guest is Sally Gourner. Sally is a polymath, an academic. She is the research director of the Planetary Health Lab at Edinburgh University. And she came on to discuss uh, oligarchic dysfunction, uh, oligarchic capitalism, essentially oligarchy, uh, the, the current paradigm that we live in today, and how to create systemic health. Sally covers so many topics. She covers how our brain is structured and how we see that in our cultural and so sociological formations. She talks about where the change needs to come from, what groups of people are going to have to be the ones that overturn the system and create something new. We talk again about the marketing of the climate crisis, how there needs to be a vision, a dream, a hope for a better future in order to create the changes that need to happen. And ultimately, she says that those changes come from creating good citizens, good citizens that care for one another and care for their environment. This is one of those really far-reaching systems conversations, and I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you do, please share it far and wide. If you love the episode, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you'll also get access to the transcripts of these interviews. The link is in the description box below, and a huge thank you to everyone who's already supporting the project. So thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. I'm so excited to get into your uh, research topic. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> so the PDF that you sent me and I've had a read through is all about um, the systemic failures of oligarchic capitalism and oligarchic mm. dysfunction in general, which is a term I hadn't come across yet and I love and I think is particularly topical given what's going on in Russia and Ukraine at the moment. Um, so could you maybe oh. get me into like why, how it is that you started focusing on that as a topic? Wow, that's a, that's a hard one because <laughs> I actually started out in um, high tech. I'm an engineer and I worked on research and development in high tech in the beginning of my career. Oh, wow. Then I got into, I switched over to my true love, which is psychology, and I went back and got a PhD in psychology. Uh -huh. But the state of the art in psychology at the time was a bit horrifying, and particularly with regards to science. Mm -hmm. So I went off looking for what, you know, why isn't psychology a science? What is science? And then I stumbled across these people who were basically, from my point of view, the heretic, the scientific heretic starting the second scientific revolution. Right. And expanding, expanding our view of how things work and, and centering it on energy flow as opposed to little material, separable material with bits in a randomly colliding universe. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is that this new understanding, this broader understanding of how energy flow works and is the basis of all organization, is it creates a logical connection between the way an energy flow works and, and an appropriate kind of science for human systems, which is based on patterns. Let's define some of those terms. So what is, what is energy flow then? Just for, you know, for the audience that maybe haven't come across it. Well, okay, so energy flow Energy, <laughs> you're going to get me in the, my physicist part. Excellent. <laughs> Let's see. I like to use the word for the example of boiling water and mm -hmm. hurricanes, both kind of indicating the same kind of thing. When you have no pressure, let's let's say you have a pot of boiling oh, of water and it's just there's no heat underneath it. It's just sitting there, mm -hmm. randomly colliding. What happens if you put heat underneath it, which is an energy flow pressure kind of mm -hmm. thing? They start moving faster and faster until they literally cannot move any faster in that pattern of organization of random collisions. Mm -hmm. And so they will then, you know, the little bubbles of, you know, will form on the sides. They'll move up to the top. They will uh, lose their heat and, and fall back down. And so they'll trigger this circular motion. Well, what is this circular motion doing? It's distributing energy faster. Mm -hmm. And it's also doing work because it's making things move in a particular direction. All right, so energy flow is the is that process of which it's 
it's um it's it it produces these systems called flow structures mm -hmm. where you have organizations that increase the capacity to do work and and circulate uh matter and energy mm -hmm. and information and resources and that's the basis of all kinds of organizations in essence that's mm -hmm. work of uh Belgian chemist Ilya Prigogine back in the 70s called self-organization theory. Anyway, so once you have this view of how organizations are formed, and there's also energy rules about how, as you get, you know, seen in an embryo, as you get bigger, the bonds holding that organization together get stretched to a breaking point. Mm -hmm. And they, fall, you know, they will then either break into two smaller things that couple back together, increase capacity to work and do and, and you know circulate or they will separate and then basically get by at the same level so in this view the increasing uh, capacity to do work and increasing complexity which also includes increasing specialization mm -hmm. becomes a matter of increasing circulation of capacity to do work and in human systems or living systems, it becomes the increasing capacity to collaborate and specialize and, mm -hmm. and learn and because information is involved because anyway, so let me stop there. So <laughs> energy flow is for me basically the force that drives all the organization in the, in the cosmos. But it's not the force that's driving the organization of human systems. Oh, no, no, it is. In fact, right. okay, so what, what we have to do is we have to add, <laughs> this will sound terrible because we have <laughs> to add information, which when you couple it with organizations that increases the capacity to do work, mm -hmm. opens the door to an understanding of intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically the capacity to respond to information in ways that increase your uh, capacities to survive for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. And those are also coupled with these patterns of growth and development we saw in the embryo, which increase, you know, so when you, living organisms get forced to a place where they have to choose between getting bigger and more sophisticated and um, basically finding a niche and staying where they are at the particular size and arrangements mm -hmm. that they've got. What happens with human systems is that we chose a particular pattern of, uh, of intelligence, which is we are a collaborative learning species. Our mm -hmm. whole strategy is not to be the fiercest or the biggest or the meanest. It's to be the most intelligent and, and to communicate and preserve lessons by speaking, eventually by writing, things mm -hmm. like that. And then using our, our belief systems to change our behavior by changing our beliefs, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. relatively rapidly. The learning part of that is really central to us. What's happened to us in, in the current situation is that we're in this situation where we've gotten so big mm -hmm. that we've, in ne of necessity, invented these hierarchical structures to hold us together and, you know, keep us in line, which, you know, you see this in all kinds of systems. That's why they have pecking orders and mm -hmm. lower animals and things like that. Unfortunately, we're for about 5,000 years ago, we developed this coercive hierarchy, this war based hierarchical system that ends up becoming more, instead of being based on defense, it becomes based on elite self interest in, in increasing their wealth and power, uh -huh. which is fundamentally oligarchy. And that's been going on for about 5,000 years. But we're getting to the place where we're now so good at destroying ourselves mm -hmm. that, you know, from my point of view, we're at this crisis point where we're at the, not only the end of the 400-year cycle of modern civilization, but the 5,000 years uh, of oligarchic hierarchies. And mm -hmm. that our, the key lesson we need to develop today is how do we have a hierarchy, because you need them beyond a certain size, mm -hmm. that is is serving the, the public as a whole, as opposed to just the interest of a few guys on top, which is fundamentally what oligarchy is. Mm, I find that so interesting because frequently when having these sorts of discussions, the sophistication and, and the complexity of the system that we live in, that we've created, 
is seen as sort of a fundamental rigid wall that we will be unable to go over um, and that there exactly. seems to be this crisis of imagination that it's sort of impossible for us as individuals to cope with the complexity of a system that's been built up over, say, 5,000 years. And yet what you were speaking about before, just a few minutes ago, you said that like sophistication is part of complex systems um, and that those systems tend to keep growing and developing and finding new ways to serve their ecosystem. I'm, I'm massively paraphrasing here. I do apologize. Um, so is, th is there a way um, for us to live in a complex modern society uh, that isn't fundamentally destructive or rigid, would you say? Well, actually, so I have to, uh, you're right that most of establishment kinds of scientists sort of portray what we have as it's the end of history. It, yeah. You know, selfishness is fixed in our genes and blah, 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 yeah. blah. And that's all, that's all very consoling to the elites mm -hmm. who pay the salaries of those people. Mm -hmm. It is, however, not a very accurate rendition of how the world works. Um, and so you also have to look at the fact that for all that 5,000 years, we've been going through these cycles of rise and falls. Yeah. And those falls are almost always due to the excesses of the oligarchy. Yeah. They extract too much. They have too many wars with each other. And if, so we, we've invented written laws and we've mm -hmm. hold them accountable. We eventually develop civil rights and democracy and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. By the way, none of those things were actually invented by the people who were originally reforming. They've been around forever and ever and ever. Yeah, yeah. So we're really drawing upon experience in different places. But in terms of can we live in a modern world without, well, I think the answer is, of course we can. Mm -hmm. And the answer is that because we are a learning species and because we are we specifically adapt by changing our belief systems, all we have to do is one one of the guys I tend to quote a lot is elder from the Shuar tribe mm -hmm. uh, in Ecuador was that we've realized that our the the our dream of you know thousands of cars and you know ever faster planes and and new equipment and technology has become a nightmare yeah and when you ask yourself, how do we get out of it? The answer is actually quite simple. You need to find a new dream and teach your, and teach your kids that new dream. Yeah. yeah. And I believe that a new dream is fundamentally that we are collaborative. That is, if you want to have a healthy civilization, you have to have synergetic collaboration, which yeah. is largely going to be based on reciprocity. Actually, I just found out about an American economist named uh, Sam Bowles, who's you know, his whole research, his whole career, he's now retired, is been about why you need, why building good citizens is more important than creating laws that try to enforce oh, goodness. God, yeah. Because oh, in fact, yeah. most people, I mean, there's a large percentage of people who do want to work for not a completely altruistic re reasons, but towards something that makes them feel like they are doing the right thing, the moral thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just, I just wonder because, um, I certainly do not think that, you know, modernity means um, a fossil fuel economy. To me, modernity means complexity. It means, you know, having populations that are uh, m millions upon millions of people that are within a community rather than um, smaller communities of a couple of hundred people collaborating on everything together. You know, it's that more dynamic system. It's just, it seems to me because of the, correct amount of you know panic that we have around the energy crisis and the the ecological crisis let alone the economic crisis um people seem to be presented with these sort of two options right now well either modernity is this um collapsing age and we're going to fall back into a dark age or it's these kind of you know romanticized notions of of tribalism and i just wonder if you know is it possible for human beings on a psychological level to live in such a complex system that has been built up over a millennia? Or is there something fundamentally too complex for individuals to, to cope with? And, and that's why these oligarchic systems tend to fall as well. Well, okay. I think <laughs> that's a tough question. That's a lot packed <laughs> yeah. into that question. Let me, <laughs> let me think here. Um, 
Can we? Absolutely, because we we have the capacity to learn. Will we? That's a whole different question. Yeah. Because the oligarchies at this point have, I mean, part of the, the real problem is that oligarchies set up the the incentives so that if you mm. earn your living by working in an oligarchic corporation, you know, you you yeah. don't have a lot of choices, which is why things are the way they are mostly. Yeah. On the other hand, two things go on. One is that at some point people, and that's happening here in, in, in America at least, people get to the place where it's not worth it to put up with that anymore. Mm-hmm. And the other part of it is that because of technology, and this is, technology is always an aid to making these kinds of changes. Think mm-hmm. of the printing press, for instance, or the telescope. Yeah. Technology is empowering new forms of organization that didn't exist anymore, mm-hmm. and uh, previously rather, and that opens the door. Now, do I know exactly what it's going to look like? No, but so what I do actually. Let me let me back off a sure. little sec- second here. So what I do is, I'm actually a polymath, and what I do is I integrate. Mm-hmm. So I specialize in putting the pieces serious scholars have put together over in lots of different fields over decades and decades and even hundreds and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And that actually shows that we are fundamentally, we have a triune nature. We have the reptilian, the lizard brain kind of things, which is what the oligarchs are are doing. Mm -hmm. We have the mammalian brain, which makes us good collaborative learners and, you know, caring about each other and nurturing each other and things like that. And we have the thinking brain, the neocortex, which makes us really good pattern finders. Mm-hmm. Now, the catch is that modernity thought it was going to build itself up about reason, on reason, which it yeah. did somewhat, and it certainly did improve things. But the way the human brain is structured is that the two lower emotional brains get all the information first. Mm. And so the only information the thinking brain gets has been already colored by the, the, the two of those. So the three brains have three different personalities. Love, strength, and intelligence are the three basic ways to think of it. Or thinking, linking, and rank. And the other way to think of it is the organizations are thinking, linking, which is, again, mammalian, and ranking, which is the reptilian. Right. If you talk to brain researchers and actually educators in in many places too, those three brains are there for a reason. They all play a role. And they come out under different conditions so that the reptilian brain comes out under stress and threat and it's the fight or flight response. But it also tends to make us lock in behind strong leaders, which is what the oligarchs Mm. tend to do. So in order to, you know, to get people to lock in behind the uh, autocrats, they create wedge issues, they create fear, they create, you know, they use the actual... (laughs) Things that they've caused, you know, <laughs> the inequities and things like that. Um, and they, and they also, I mean, nationalism is really tribalism, and tribalism is really love of one's group. Right. So they harness tribalism towards oligarchic locking it behind the strong man leader too. So if you want to get a healthy society, you have to figure out how to create the conditions that ba- keep those in relative balance, the three brains in relative balance. Oh, that's and that's a balance of challenge, discipline, and support. Too much of any of those things creates problems. So too much thr- challenge becomes threat. Too much support becomes spoiling kids. And too much discipline becomes oppression, which tends to make you downshift into your lizard brain anyway. That's fascinating. This brings me Back to the, I mean, I think a lot of the sociology suggests that the way to get good citizens is to base it on fairness, reciprocity. Have you ever heard of Eleanor Ostrom? She won a a Nobel Prize. Yeah, I have, yeah. For governing the commons. And so if you look across time and cultures, people tend to come up with these certain common rules that, that allow you to have fairness in the governing of commons. And so we need to basically follow those kinds of rules, I think, in setting up the incentives for and the structures, the educational structures, for one thing, need to be changed because right now we're still using the Prussian plan of factory model schools where you're trying to get people who were who can read and write but are afraid to go out on their own. So there's a lot of learned helplessness and 
pecking order politics and high stakes tests, which, you know, basically keeps you from really becoming the best person you can or even mastering the uh, material Mm -hmm. just in order to get ranked and placed in a pigeonhole. So anyway, any other questions? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Okay. So essentially what we... (laughs) What we're establishing then is that um, the best way to to change society is to address how, what it is to be a good citizen, to create better citizens that will then change the belief system in order uh, that those people and those generations will then uh, right. make the fundamental systemic changes that are required. What is? Let's talk about the oligarchic dysfunction, though the the traits or the tropes mm. of that, um, and especially how we're seeing it sort of come to. I don't want to say fruition because it's always been there, but perhaps how the mask is maybe falling off in modern society now and why well, is it they are driving, I mean, inherently their own destruction as well. There's a logical fallacy in what they do, surely. Well, th- there is, <laughs> but uh, I mean, they too, most, mo- most oligarchs themselves believe that they are pursuing the good things for the society as a whole. It's just that they have these really, they're pretty much out of touch with the reality of, like, oh, yes, I, I shouldn't say this. Um, <laughs> I used to work for one who was, I mean, he was, he had, I mean, maybe I shouldn't go there. Um, <laughs> Anand Girhadas has this book about winner take all, and it's all about, mm-hmm. it's all about how. The, the the wonderful beneficence that is the philanthropy that's coming out of this uber wealthy class that's uh, out now mm-hmm. isn't going to save us. And it's not, and it's really being done because when you give and don't have to receive, it puts you in a, in a, what is seen as a morally superior um, right. position. Mm-hmm. Whereas if the sociology will say that if you want to have a healthy society, you have to take in equal measure so that there's this wonderful book called no more throwaway people which is it's about time banking mm-hmm. and they found out that if you want to empower people you give them an opportunity to contribute and they have their contributions accepted by the society or the, the larger group and it doesn't actually matter what the contribution is it could be you know you can be child care or you can be dam collector, you can be an accountant. When you take people who have been sort of marginalized and disenfranchised and sort of left out, you know, the old, the poorly educated, the disabled, all of these people who are, the, the, the society basically considers them worthless and so they don't get any res- respect. Mm. It's having a system whereby they are they are contributing and they know that they're contribution is being used and appreciated or valued in some ways that then energizes those people. Mm -hmm. So what oligarchs do is that they pay people to rationalize their behavior. So economists now say homo economicus is doing great things and yeah, and that's the way the world works best and so on and so forth. And, And so they have this belief that, you know, so I'm maximizing my profit. That's what I'm supposed to do. And that's good for the society because all these economists tell me so. And so they feel good about themselves. In fact, but it's getting so blatant. I mean, this business about having Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk go up on these little 15-minute space flights. Yeah. Jeff Bezos actually had the audacity to thank the employees who at Amazon who's union efforts he's crushing Mm -hmm. and who makes them live under these horrible (laughs) conditions whereby they you know they don't have enough bathroom breaks or yeah you know god help you you know it's just sick but the contrast is getting pretty glaring so that i i mean it boggles my mind that these guys can realize think that it's actually the right way to do it but we have these debates all the time and especially amongst establishment uh influencers and and you know pundits and things if I, if I may interject here, the, the, the thing that I often wonder about, um, because I believe that most of us 
in the same environment and with the same opportunities and having lived the same life as many of these oligarchs, realistically, our behavior would probably be quite similar. Like, I don't think that they are particularly special or particularly psychopathic. I think that their um, rise to rule <laughs> it has engendered sort of certain behaviors that probably would have affected most of us. Nonetheless, I right. mean, you know, can we say that they really think that they're doing the right thing in this like hyper connected world where there is so much daily criticism of their um how they treat employees, you know, wage inequities, the damage to the environment. I mean, what what what's going on there that they can still genuinely think that they're doing the right thing? Because they can't just lock themselves in an ivory tower anymore, you know? The human mind is pretty amazing in terms of its ability to rationalize. <laughs> I mean, again, I work for one. And he, you know, this guy was, he was charming. He was intelligent. His heart was definitely in the right place. And he treated his employees like disposable cogs. Mm. You know, minimized the amount of money he gave them, took credit for their work, mm. you know, and used the money that didn't give, uh, you know, if he got raised money to, to do a report, he didn't bother to use the money to get the report done. He would just use it to, you know, wine and dine and fly here and there and give great speeches and so on and right. so forth. Okay. So the, the part that I like about my work is that when you start at the really the fundamental at the energy flow level mm -hmm. and you build this stuff up, it, you realize that there's like two ha two parts to to the systemic health in human systems. One is cultural, which we've been sort of talking about, but the other is economic, which mm -hmm. has to do with where does the money go, mm -hmm. and are you using that money to nourish the organizations that actually do all the work? Now, in in early capitalism, you were that was part of the theory was that you made a profit and you reinvested it in, in your your capacities. And, but that's not what we do anymore. Now you extract ever more profit and it only it's only for the, the guys in management or owners or shareholders. Mm -hmm. And this is basic Keynesianism. When you don't have money going to the workers, then they don't have any money to buy things. And when they, the le and they go into debt, the debt causes actually inflation and overhead. Uh -huh. And eventually they just work themselves in a place where they they can't survive anymore and that's pretty much what's happening now especially yeah. with the inflation so w what would be a way of restructuring actually do you know what first of all we're talking about oligarchic dysfunction is there a functioning right. oligarchy is that possible no i mean oligarchy is basically my term for i mean the way i see oligarchy is a culture and mm. this culture can, in fact, what it does is it tends to come in it. It's like a disease. It's like a virus. You know, so we start off on modernity. You start off as free enterprise democracies, mm -hmm. common cause rights and, and civil rights and rights of man and things like this. Okay. But of course, the, the, the old oligarchic stuff is, hasn't gone away and it sort of insinuates itself. Mm -hmm. around everything so you have you know you have the privateers and you have the corporations who are just really meant for the for enriching the, the, the few big guys and so over time they kind of they're various cycles of rise and fall but we've basically we don't live in a free enterprise democracy we live in a capitalist oligarchy mm -hmm. and and you could actually say the same kind of self-serving practices also it cause you know, it's Stalin. It's mm -hmm. so that you have communist oligarchies and you have religious oligarchies and you mm -hmm. even have academic oligarchies. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a matter of, of taking a hierarchy and making it specifically self-serving for elites only. And how do we restructure that hierarchy to make it collaborative or community serving? Well, I think that's the challenge of our time. Mm. And part of what we're we're trying to do is figure that out so we have a, a a loose group of people from um erasmus university in rotterdam and their mm -hmm. business school who've done some i mean there's math that goes with these kinds of 
implicate energy flow implications mm -hmm. so you have to you can measure how much energy is circulate circulating internally and where it's going as a measure of systemic health mm -hmm. so they've they've started applying uh, actual real numbers to some of these um because we're what we're looking for is the opposite of systemic health and and resilience is basically fragility and instability mm -hmm. so we're looking for instabilities but i'm actually more interested in in their human side of things how do they think the cultural side because there's also there's a lot of this stuff going on in various social science fields mm -hmm. there's servant leadership and purposive leadership and things like this and i think we're just going through a time where we're actually working out how it would work mm -hmm. How do you get a, how do you build a hierarchy that just isn't as bureaucracy that's serving elites? Mm. And it's not going to be easy because <laughs> it's going to be novel. So we can't look back at a time in history where that existed. It would be completely new in human history. Not at this scale, I don't think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, because you really do need, yeah, well, it's kind of like the, the invention of the nation state was one of the other things yeah. that happened with modernity. I think about all of the things that medieval people believed mm. that are just gone with the wind. You know, you had three estates. The uh, serfs were to work the land that all might eat. The uh, clergy was to pray for all and the aristocrats were to fight to protect all. Mm. And, you know, princes were ordained by God for the protection of their people, so on and so forth. And what happened was there was so much corruption in all of the institutionalized hierarchies that it eventually fell apart. But it, I mean, it, we're talking about the Reformation Wars and then the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment. So, it's, you know, we can sort of, I mean, it, it's hard because we do know so much more and communication is so much better nowadays. And people are better educated and they can read and they have all mm -hmm. these sources. So, you know, there's this mystical saying that in times like these, many may, one must. That is either, well, there's lots of people doing these reforms. It, we mm -hmm. really are have a second enlightenment going on. Mm -hmm. Which one and whether or not it will trigger the change that clarifies which which how do we make these things come together so that we can move do more work move energy faster by being in synergetic collaboration through common cause culture and resilient structures i don't know would it would it demand um because i mean the very nature of oligarchy is that it, it is self-serving for those elite and so this is a question that right. we kind of bump up against a lot in the podcast. I mean, what, what do you do about those elite? Do you kind of hope that they'll have a, a moment of um, clarity and help restructure the system? Because surely the problem is when so much power... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you're laughing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's an absurd thought. Like well, so much power is concentrated at the at the top, even if you create the perfect system even if you map out that hierarchy how do you put it in place well okay it's it's that okay so i don't believe that the change is going to come from the grassroots it's going to come from the middle level it always mm -hmm. comes from the next level down basically so let's look at that vladimir putin there are other oligarchs some are the insider oligarchs they're not all you know so so well anyway it, he has a cadre of of hardliner nationalist advisors who are, you know, part of his oligarchy. But if he gets in trouble and, and he's causing enough trouble for them, yeah, they may take him out. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even Gandhi said that, you know, his nonviolent civil disobedience wouldn't work with a country other than Britain at the time. Cause they had all of they, you know, they had some moral standing fiber in there, even though they were, mm. you know, in, engaged in all this imperialism. Mm, I see. So, what I mean, are we talking about um, the middle class in 
you know, for Western oligarchies, are, are we talking about the middle class or are we talking about the, the people just below? I mean, who is, what is the middle level here? I think it's always, it's going to be a consortium of some people who are really wealthy because, I mean, all of these people are not evil sociopaths. Yeah. Some of them are, actually. <laughs> but the hope is to get, there was a book uh, by one of our guys, Ralph Nader, who's a consumer advocate anyway, but he wrote a book called Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. <laughs> and it was basically about, and he listed a number of the people who were super rich who are also looking for a better way than, and knowing that this is not the way human society is going to survive. Mm. You know, I mean, even, even things like, what was this recent movie, Don't Look Up? Yeah. Which was, it's a kind of a com combination of a parody and stark reality about how the political system works, where they ignore science and they, because A, they are more wound up with the moves of their political rivals and B, because they think they, they alone will be able to be rescued from the situation. Mm. And I think that's true. I think Ukraine is, is, I don't know if it's going to be the final thing, but it, I have a lot of friends who are either from Eastern Europe, Romania or Poland or someplace like that. And they're looking at this and going, oh my God, I can't believe this would happen in today's reality. Yeah. Yeah. But we have a lot of people struggling to figure out how, well, the other part of it is that if we're a learning species, we need decently accurate information being distributed, but we have, we have oligarchic media who's, who's maximizing their, their owner's wealth by hyping the controversies and emphasizing mm. the outliers and the extremists, not actually having intelligent conversations. That is such an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, there's all this talk about disinformation and it's come up on this show quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I see a lot, you know, in sort of grassroots um, activist networks or, you know, people go on about like the media, the media. The media. And as a, I've spoken about this a lot, but like as a journalist, it drives me mad when people talk about the media, capital T, capital M, because like, it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, oligarchic media being used to destabilize or to disseminate false information in order to divide, divide and conquer. So, yeah, that's very, very interesting. And it's not something that I think we think about happening, certainly as a Brit, because we have, you know, we have BBC News and we have um, un laws about journalistic bias. But nonetheless, in an increasingly online world, people aren't really turning on to the six o'clock news, are they? They can get any kind of information right. they want anywhere. Yeah. Right, because, I mean, these people really know how to attack the emotional side of the human brain. Mm. And, and you, you get more eyes with, with blood and violence and controversy and fear and threat. And... But they're also, I think, exhausting people. Compassion fatigue. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, I actually just came across this term this week. Yeah, um, when essentially when you, you're so overwhelmed with um, secondhand bad news or secondhand shock or secondhand trauma that the brain just shuts down and like cannot empathize yeah. or feel compassion anymore. Apparently it afflicts carers a lot, but also we're seeing it on a societal level because of the 24-hour news cycle. Oh, yeah. I mean, and well, and the, the other thing is that there's a lot of people who, okay, let's let's take the more controversial one, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Well, cancel culture is actually also a tyranny, and it's it's an inability to listen, it's inability to to learn. I mean, it, it's very extremist view of how racism and sexism works, where all whites are automatically racist and all you know men are automatically sexist and. And there's a certain truth to it, but it, when you do that, you sort of water down the actual impact and the meaning of the oppressions that do happen in the, in those issues. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I just, you know, I also feel really, I have a lot of sympathy for the left because, you know, leftist politics has been squeezed into such a tiny arena of possibility that I think cancel culture is kind of one of those like low hanging fruits oh. um, that has, you know, data behind it. Like they have shown that deplatforming is a really effective way um, to undermine messaging or to kind of get narratives out of, um, ah. out of the, the zeitgeist. 
Um, so like I'm, I'm all for the elements of it, but I think when it becomes this kind of ideological crusade, um, that is no longer tempered by argument debate, um, or even, you know, data, um, I, th I think it's because the left has nowhere else to go. I mean, like, look at it. What, what else can let young, especially young leftists do apart from cancel people on Twitter? Like what else can they do? See, now that's an interesting question. What else could they do? I mean, you may know more about this than I do. I mean, yeah, it's a tough question. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I mean, I'm really, I like your point. I mean, I'm all for you. I'm actually also more of a progressive. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'm sort of like, I'm a middle ground person where most of my energy goes into the intellectual part of things. Sure. And making the connections, but that doesn't, you know, that's not going to get a lot of people. Well, it's that thing about the brain again, isn't it? Um, like not yeah. everybody can be a polymath and integrate everything. Not everybody has that kind of lion-hearted sure. like courage to start a revolution or to sacrifice themselves. Like for me, part of restructuring our social system would also be leading into the nuances of like duality and dynamic systems and where we allow people to fulfill different functions, even in, in activism, for example, or restructuring. Because I think the issue is that there's kind of only one way to act. And I think a lot of, say, ugh, activism, and I don't really know where we're going here, but here we are, um, is kind of coming from that reptilian brain because of the level of precarity that people experience. Like people are living in a kind of fight or flight constant state of threat. Um, the classes are being squeezed. There's no more opportunities. And so the response to the system is the sort of gut reaction. And whilst you need that to drive things through, I mean, look what Extinction Rebellion did to raise awareness of the climate crisis in a very short period of time. There also needs to be that moment where you bring in the mammalian brain and, you know, the neocortex and you start to think about the, the you know, values or integrating information. Um, so to me, it's like we're living in that. How do I put it? We're so downshifted in the lizard brain. Part. Totally, totally. It's like activism today or even discussions about what to do about the state of the world are just sort of the shadow of that oligarchy again. It's that reaction in re reptilian form. And I think that's why despite the amount of people talking, we've, we're not actually, we're not progressing to the next level of, of restructuring, I think. I don't know. Well, Okay, so here's here's the possibility, which is, okay, so the sociological side of things really does talk about this common cause culture business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's let's use the Eleanor Ostrom kinds of things. I think if you had a clear picture that what the goal is to get people who, well, it's to get people, like you say, it's to get people who have different talents and different perspectives to be able to work together mm -hmm. because it's fair, because there's accountability, because you're really serving the health of the whole, mm -hmm. um, all these kinds of things. Maybe that would help them. I mean, because I agree with you. I think the cancel culture is really sort of a symptom of our particular times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where, where people don't have anything else to do. So we're going to just get fanatical about or ideological about a particular aspect of the systemic problem mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a toughie i mean talking about restructuring any kind of system and even that like system and people talk about this like it's the system no 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 it's multiple systems it's systems upon systems upon systems it's, <laughs> it's the system of the system is yeah. what it is yeah 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 it is <laughs> so i also had this Wonderful experience with, I, I, I got taken to, I got paid to go give a talk in, with Newt Gingrich's think tank, who Newt, Newt Gingrich is at a, a pretty far right American politician. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was doing a um, conference in Japan on great change or big change, which are the, the kinds of big cultural changes shifts we had when uh, we went from medieval to modern. Now, we're, from my point of view, we're going from modern to either integral or regenerative learning society. Anyway, so I was in, in this techie group with a bunch of, you know, with Japanese counterparts in engineering and things like that. And one of my, my uh, 
Japanese counterpart talked about the Meiji Restoration, and his, his basic co comment was, "You Westerners have no idea how to make great change because you only talk about the things that you that that are wrong that you're going to have to get rid of." Yeah. Where you really, what you really want to do is you want to point out the 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 noble purpose or mission that's already intrinsic in the society that most people still aspire to, and say how that's going to be like a butterfly sh shedding yeah. its skin. And, so that you're going to bring that to a whole new level of function and beauty. And I think that you could definitely make a case for um, free enterprise democracy and becoming an authentic free enterprise democracy by making it fair, by making democracy itself not only just about what, about voting, but actually being able to impact things. So mm -hmm. getting, getting money out of politics so the contributions are not steering things i mean absolutely i mean if you imagine uh, mo modernity um or our, mm -hmm. our world today um and it was built on collaborative um fair transparent um process yeah. and it had the I, you know the lives of the people uh, by species planet like if the whole was put first rather than elite and we moved away from extractivism we live in a beautiful world and we have to remember you know the progress that has been made in terms of science in terms of medicine in terms you know people are living maybe the mental health not better lives because it is an incredibly oppressive system but nonetheless there's a lot of progress that has been made and we need to focus on those things and be like look we can achieve that we can continue to achieve these good things that have come out of right. a desire to help the greater good and we can build a whole world like that. It doesn't have to be extractive. It doesn't have to be exploitive. The the the, the options are not either collapse or tribalism. There was a whole other new world there for us to build together. And I don't understand why it's not being talked about more. Because if you face people with the two current <sighs> options, of course they're terrified. Of course they turn off. Of course they feel disempowered and then nothing happens. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I agree. I, I mean, I so so I think the problem is narrative. We need a coherent narrative that articulates that other, that third way. Mm -hmm. I hate to say that. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Blair turned out so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that better way, say, or a, a more hopeful way. Yeah, because it has to be something that. Because you have to be able to say to the oligarchs, tap them on the shoulder and say, hello, logical fallacy. Um, if you keep going, there's going to, it doesn't matter how much money you're going to have. There's not going to be a planet to live on anymore. And then you also right. have to say to, you know, the working classes, hey, come and get involved because it's not just about some major altruistic thing where you're saving, you know, the earth that you live in. You can actually have a better life in 10 years. Um, if we just make these couple of tweaks, you know, it's about, coming together and having a vision for the future rather than careening over a cliff as far as i'm concerned exactly exactly mm. but it's interesting because i haven't uh, while i've thought about this a fair whack i haven't thought about what kind of hierarchies you would need to put in. i think there's an instinctive you know you would definitely need a hierarchy you need people to be able to make decisions at appropriate moments but how do you i mean with the complexity that is human psychology, how do you organize a hierarchy around our capacity for, you know, corruption, quite frankly? Well, yes, indeed. And and the ability to have non-accountability, which I think is the cru What's real that? crux of the problem. Well, okay, one of Ostrom's points is that you have to have accountability so that if you do something that violates the, you know, moral, legal, ethical kinds of things that, that, that you get some kind of feedback that has some oh, kind right. of impact mm. on your behavior. Mm. And sexism, racism, and oligarchy are all about impunity. Mm. So you get to do what you want, and then nobody can touch you, actually. But see, this is, uh, people have spoken about in the past, you know, maybe the the need for a, a philosopher king or the other side of the coin, a benevolent dictator. Yeah. 
But the problem is always, well, then who do you get in once that, if you find that one diamond in the rough, that one incorruptible human soul, um, how do you find the next one in the next generation? Exactly right, which is the problem with monarchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, right, absolutely. I mean, what what does your research... Well, I mean, Please, go ahead. I, what it, it says is that people have been working on this because you can go back to it. Plato's Republic was really yeah. about this kind of question, you yeah. know. I mean, I also take some comfort from the whole notion of emergence. Mm-hmm. So that is, you know, what, what motivates me is that if we get this very clear picture that there are four major system, uh, pillars of systemic health. One is this um, regenerative circulation. So you have to get money to invest in, in all the things that, may, that do the work and keep us healthy. You have to have resilient structure, which means you can't have big things, can't get too big because then when they, what they happens is you get this, the more you have, the more you get kind of circle, a positive feedback cycle, and it sucks all the wealth up from the bottom, which is what oligarchy is doing now. Mm-hmm. So you need resilient structures, a balance of big and little, a particular mathematically precise balance of big and little. You need regenerative circulation, but then you need common cause culture and you need effective collaborative learning. So we need to be able to adapt, change our, our cultural mindset once we can actually establish the, the, the science so that there's an empirical basis for a choice that people are making. But, you know, sort of get out of the oligarchic part of all of that where you're like in academics you're just battling each other and, mm. and you're struggling for money so we're we're not investing in real research uh, open-ended research anymore we're basically investing in the people who already claim they know what they're d- doing yeah 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 that fallacy <laughs> of expertise again <laughs> right so Okay, regenerative circulation, resilient structure, common cause culture, effective collaborative learning. Right. Let's, okay, we've discussed common cause culture. You just explained effective collaborative learning, regenerative circulation, the flow of money, getting, and that's that's a little bit of communism in there, isn't it? Like each two, oh, what's the Marx quote about everybody having what they, the one that needs gets or whatever. Um, it's not that at all. It's it's regenerative circulation is actually investing in in. Well, I mean, in, in the capitalist system, it would have been investing in your employees and your infrastructure. Mm. So, I um, mean, it's not just it's not. Okay, so this all of these four are tied together and they in, influence each other, and so some some things don't sort naturally into one one place or another. Sure. Um. But one of the things you need to do for um, both collaborative culture and effective learning is not just tolerate, but appreciate differences and different skills and talents and things like that. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you're never going to have absolute equality. That's not a goal. Sure. The goal is to make everybody have the opportunity so that they, they start, you know, it really is a level playing field. Yeah. So everybody has access to you know, food, shelter, education, health care. Human dignity. Uh, human dignity, mm. right. Mm. So these, these are fundamentals, but it's not, a, but it doesn't mean that you're just going to automatically take from one person. You, you will have limits on how, how much somebody can make because if, if you don't yeah. have limits, then they will become corrupt and start sucking up the wealth from everywhere and corrupting and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. So the one that's kind of fascinating me the most is resilient structure, because I had Jessie Henshaw on the show recently, and she Mm -hmm. raised a really fascinating point about systems and a narrative that's sort of not being discussed at the moment enough, which is that growth is a part of life. Growth is good as long as degeneration is also allowed. As long as we make space for degeneration, wow. as long as we make space for death, and that's the cycle of everything on a you know biological level, ecological level, etc. Um, and so, thinking about that, when I see this resilient structures having a balance mathematically of of big things and small things, and ensuring that the big things don't get 
too big how would that be right. by allowing for those big things to collapse and fall away and be replaced by smaller things i mean what, what does that look like i think we, it's less it's more efficient not to f- force them to collapse in fact it's mm-hmm. because it, there's always the possibility that the whole system will collapse not yeah. just the one company yeah um i would say that i disagree with jesse on that growth it's not always good it's 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 not how big you grow, it's how you grow big. Sure. That's... In the term. And so it's growth itself. I mean, especially gr- GDP growth today is just, a, it doesn't, doesn't check where the money goes. No, it's mad. So, yeah, it's crazy. So GDP growth in particular is an insane measure for <laughs> systemic health. Yeah. Um, I think it's not at all true that you absolutely have to, growth is always good. She, no, I, she didn't say growth is always good. She was saying that, that growth is a, is a part of systems because the systems grow and then they reach a, a moment of stasis and then they collapse. Um, so I think it was more to counteract the narrative that all growth is bad as we're seeing sort of right now as a reaction to, you know, oligarchy. Um, she was more drawing awareness to the fact that growth is an inherent part of systems and life. I think that's that's an ecosystem view, mm-hmm. which I don't think necessarily holds with human systems per se. Because uh, in that ecosystem view, it, there's a succession of of ecosystem forms. You go from gra- uh, grassland to pinelands to oak forests, and then that's the su- supremacy. And then it all collapses, and it's and they recycle all the stuff coming mm. back over again. Unfortunately, that's not a really good metaphor for human systems, because when we collapse, we don't necessarily recycle the information. We don't, re- you know, so mm. now we have this whole uh, business about there may have been a, a prior civilization. You've heard this, the Goblateki stuff. No, I haven't. Oh, OK. Well, we ter- tend to the current orthodoxy is that hierarchical civilizations began about 5,000 years ago. And that, you know, before that, there was like a brief period of agriculture. And, you know, before that, we were just Neolithic. Um, But now we have beginning evidence that more like 12,900 years ago, prior to that, there were major civilizations that were putting together these amazing huge stone structures that were really well fitted. And that probably what happened was that, and they probably already had agriculture and things like that. Probably what happened was there was a meteor strike. This is not the one that killed off the dinosaurs, but this one happened about 12,500 years ago, created a massive global catastrophe, which essentially wiped out most of that civilization, which was probably pretty global because there's indication of, of exchanges of culture and contact between like North America and and Mm -hmm. Central America and Asia and things like that. So they think now that it's beginning to look like perhaps we are almost like in a post-traumatic stress syndrome where the people who survived that lost a lot of the culture that, that they'd had before and became more, what, traumatized by the whole mm-hmm. loss of global civilization and became very defensive and nationalistic and tribal and things like that where they had been less so before. God, that's fascinating. So as if all of sort of modern human history could be seen as that shadow reaction to that huge singular traumatic event. Exactly. Wow. Right. That really shifts the paradigm. Although it, it does. does also provide... Yeah, I mean... It provides a great basis for a new story as well, though. Like, let's let's move past our trauma point, people. <laughs> let's start building with the best exactly. of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, Sally, so. um, what is next in your work and where can people find it? Because I know my listeners are going to want to read more about what you do. Wow. I I've, I've actually written like four books all mm-hmm. by myself and then a bit co-author and two or three more. Um, unfortunately, pretty much all of them are out of print now. Okay. So, okay, but so the, 
best way is, is you can email me and I'll send you copies of my <laughs> oh. collapsible oligarchic capitalism and um, rise of regenerative learning. But I mean, I have a bunch of academic papers out now. My focus now is on these measures of systemic health. Mm -hmm. And then actually I'm working, in theory, I'm the research director for Edinburgh University's Planetary Health Lab. Oh, wow. And I have a student who's, yeah, well, it sounds good. They're not paying me any money. This is kind of like a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a student who's going to, who's trying to, um, I think, put the pieces together, particularly of the cultural parts, to um, figure out how we can change the governmental pol policies to support, to use the framework of systemic health that, that comes out of my work to support um, the SDGs, the Sustainable yeah. Development Goal, including inequality, gross inequality and poverty and, and more the cultural ones than, than the um, environmental ones, because the environmental ones, from my point of view, are actually a symptom of the deep systemic cultural ca cause of oligarchic capitalism. Yeah. So that if we're going to really solve climate change and those kinds of things, we need to attack the underlying d sociological drivers of the of it. Completely agree. If we um, if we were just beginning this talk rather than coming to the end of it, I would go off on my pr very practice net zero rant. Um, it boggles the brain. Oh, what's your net zero rant? <laughs> <laughs> I missed it. Um, okay. In a nutshell, um, I think it's absurd to use the same economic frameworks that have engendered, ex you know, extractive and exploitative practices to save um, our ecology. It's absolute nonsense. Um, it will only lead to huge, bigger inequity. And to me, it means that the moment that you you commodify. Um, you know, they commodified the forest. That's why there's no more forest. Now they're saying they have to, you know, we have exactly. to save the forest. So they're commodifying CO2 and trying to create these credits. And it just means that the moment that there is some kind of technology, there is some kind of way in which we've dealt with the CO2 problem, they'll just go straight back to commodifying the forest and chopping them down. Exactly. Um, it's not the answer. They need to restructure the values. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> No, we have to do is figure out how to do that. <laughs> Welcome to Planet Critical. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I'm so looking forward to getting my teeth into more of your work. Tell me, um, who would you like to platform? Oh, I really like this guy, Michael Hudson. I mean, he's, he doesn't call it oligarchic capitalism, but He's, he's, he does the flow network stuff and he's, you know, been in international monetary flows for most of his adult life. And he's just, just ask him about his life's history and it will be amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Great. I will reach out to him. Thank you so much for your time, Sally. All right. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Sally's work, her email address is in the description box below. So you can get your hands on a copy of her books. I've also put links to some of her articles so you can have a read through her academic work. Remember to subscribe to this channel and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it and want access to the interview transcripts, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is also in the description box below. A big thank you to the Planet Critical patrons and supporters. This work just wouldn't be happening without you. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.